welcome to CXQA Live, the home of the agent-centric contact center philosophy, where we, we talk about this every week, and it hasn't gotten mm -hmm. boring yet. We talk about how agents with the right training, tools, and connection with your company are going to be a revenue growth and protection center for your business or brand. They're going to be the best diagnostic tool that you could possibly have for your business. They're going to ensure that your customers are satisfied and connected. They're going to produce more and better work. And they're going to want to stay and contribute to the long-term success of your company. And today, I'm very excited because we have joining us on the show, Sherry Kendall, our resident CX <laughs> training expert. And Sherry has nearly 25 years of learning, education, and corporate training experience. And much of that is in CX. And, and you know, Sherry, you've been a huge part of the show since the, the beginning last year. You now, as of today, hold the record for the most episodes as special guest, and we're so glad to have you back with us. Thank you, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to put that on my LinkedIn profile, by the way. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, now, you've cooked up some really great stuff for us today as well, um, and the title of our episode is Connecting CX Training Analytics to Business Outcomes. And I'm not going to really preface this a whole lot. I'm just going to let you take us on this journey, Sherry. Wonderful. Thank you, Rob. And, and thank you for um, this opportunity. It's always a great, uh, I love speaking with you and Jacob. It's always a great, great time. Um, I also just want to say thank you for all the great conversations we have between the webinars. Um, I truly consider you one of my friends um, now in the CX space. So thank you. Um, Same. You and I met. Thanks. <laughs> you and I met yesterday and, and I shared my love story with CX. Um, and um, I thought I'd begin there because it ties directly into our topic today. So my youngest son, and by the way, everyone, I have his permission to tell his story because I definitely believe we have to ask permission to tell other stories. Um, he is autistic. And um, we've experienced a lot of challenges in customer service and customer experience, both of those spaces. Um, the world, you know, he's 27 now. So this was a time when autism wasn't spoken about all of the time. Uh, people didn't understand it and the world wasn't built for us. Um, and so we would go into public um, and into stores and he would have very challenging behaviors and we'd be asked to leave perhaps implied not to return. Um, uh, cashiers would say things that would blow my mind. Um, and um, I, it, it became very apparent to me that these folks we interacted with every day had the ability to really enrich our lives or make it more difficult. Um, and I didn't know at the time, but that's when I fell in love with uh, customer service and CX as well. Mm. And my dear friend, Nate Brown, um, the man with the with the suits <laughs> and and just such a great human all around. He always reminds me, let's focus on who's doing it right and build from there. Um, and so with that, I'd like to share the story of Kathy um, that worked at a local large vet chain. Um, I'll keep the name private, but uh, she this was in Eugene, Oregon. And my son took his beloved service dog, Nacho, in for what they call a comprehensive exam. And we get there and we'd not been there before. And Kathy says, OK, thank you for bringing Nacho. You can pick him up at five this evening. This was not something Bryce was was willing to do or even made sense in his day to day life. So he starts to panic. And I figured this is where it's all going to fall apart. Here we go. And that is not what happened. Mm. Kathy immediately changed her approach with Bryce. Speaking to Bryce, now sometimes this happens, but folks will start to talk to me, which anyone that's listening, that's not the strategy to use. Um, she spoke to Bryce. She asked him what he needed. He said, I can't leave Nacho. I need to be with him. She immediately said, you know what? We're going to change the, pro the process today. Um, I'm going to meet with the vet. We're going to uh, get permission to have you stay on site. You're going to be with Nacho in the room while this exam happens. I'll have you out of here in 30 minutes. And she stuck true to her word. What I found out later is she had notated his chart. So we never had that issue again, ever. We wow. never had to go through that. Wow. Um, and so um, that that is somebody that's doing it right. Mm -hmm. And while I don't know their training processes and practices, I would not hesitate to guess that there was soft skills training. 
that this individual understood the processes and practices of that org, what changes she could make that would not negatively impact their business outcomes. Yeah. And also um, uh, she was empowered, right? So a well-trained customer service rep is only as good as they are empowered no. um, to yeah, make 100%. those changes. I mean, this is such a powerful story, right? And and I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing it with our audience. And 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 ultimately- you know, we talk about training and, and a lot of CX organizations just think of it as a necessary evil, which is ironic mm -hmm. because a lot of CX organizations are seen by the larger business as a necessary evil. And then training <laughs> is sort of like the necessary evil of the necessary evil, right? And, there, and there's like this double disconnect because what you, what you see in, in a healthy training environment in CX is these components that you just mentioned, right? It's not just knowledge and skills and processes, it's empowerment. It's it's even connecting for that employee the why of the organization and 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 the culture and values of the organization and and the ability to know as uh, an employee, these are the boundaries that I'm allowed to operate within. These are the well, decisions that yes. I'm able to make for myself. And also these are the things that I know are important to us as a company that are going to motivate me sometimes to ask for an exception to the policy. Right. And, and, yes. and if, and if there isn't that sort of full human aspect to the training, right. Then you miss out on opportunities like the one that Kathy took to make a difference for you and your son and for Nacho that day. And I think there's so much to take away here. Um, we could just talk about that story and just <laughs> pick it apart, right? And yes. and probably sing a couple of courses of kumbaya because it just makes us feel good. <laughs> it's, a, it's it and it is it is important to have those moments. But I love how this story, this experience, was starting to build into you uh, a passion for for training and for CX. And I'd love for you to tell us what you have in store for us today. Yes. Yeah, so today we're gonna. I want to talk about three areas of analysis. So content, trainer, and design. Um, and the questions that we're asking as, a, as opposed to uh, analysis tools, right? There are a lot of analysis tools and maybe I'll come back and we'll talk about those. But right now, today, we're gonna focus on what questions should be, we be asking and who do we ask those questions of? That's really good. So for those of you at home taking notes, it's Trainer, content, and design. These are the three components that we're going to focus on and uh, thinking about how we connect those things in the training environment to business outcomes. So where, where are we going to start today? We're going to start with content analysis. So um, are we creating learning experiences that teach the learners, the participants, to do the things we need them to do, right? That's where the rubber meets the road. Are they going to be able to do those things that are mission critical for our business, that positively impact our business outcomes, and ultimately assist with customer retention? So we simply begin with the data you already have, right? So if you are a small organization, a small startup, which is actually my forte, I've been working with them for a lot longer than a large organization. Um, and, and this can feel daunting, right? Oh my gosh, data, I'm supposed to collect it. Where, how, oh my goodness, where do I begin? Begin with what you have, test and quiz scores. So are, are the scores particularly low? If they are low, um, are you reviewing the trainer? Which trainer was responsible for that content? Is there a coaching opportunity there? Um, are you capturing feedback from the participants? Why? Uh, what are they experiencing? Do they feel prepared for that knowledge assessment? Hmm. Um, amount, if, if you're looking at e-learning, right? Because what happened during the pandemic, we all went remote. Some of us still have virtual face-to-face -face training, but there was a lot of e-learning that was also um, uh, developed. So on in e-learning modules, are you looking at the time spent on each module? Does it align with what your vision was? Um, what is the completion rate? Are they completing the modules? Are Is there a trend where they're opting out? <laughs> so perhaps there's a, a or a piece of content that is just you we did not provide enough information or they don't have any connection to the what what's in it for me and they're choosing to leave the e-learning module at that time 
Um, and one thing that is really important, what questions are the learners asking? Is there a trend? If everybody's asking about average handle time, we've got a problem, right? If you're in a contact center, if everyone is asking about um, uh, a certain policy or process, we need to go back to our design and ensure that we're, we're making those changes. But perhaps it's not the design of the content, it also could be the trainer. So really important that we're capturing that, but also deep diving. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there, right? Um, you know, one thing I, I just, I kind of pulled out of what you're saying, and again, we're thinking about specific business outcomes that we want the training to facilitate, right? Mm -hmm. And just actually designing the amount of time that is spent on yeah. specific content that leads towards a greater understanding of what's going to drive those business outcomes. You know, um, you know, a big one right now is customer retention. Yes. Um, you know, we're going to talk about that a couple of times, I think, today. But, um, you know, it's ironic how often training organizations end up being so reactive that they lose mm -hmm. sight completely of where the organization has stated the organization needs to go because we're just putting out fires. We're like, oh, we had this one call last week five times and it did not go well. So we're going to take half of our training time for new employees and spend it on that one call type. And then suddenly we're just way out of balance, right? We tend to be so reactive. And so there, you, you can't lose the long-term business outcomes when you're designing the content um, you know, uh, and the, and a, the analyzation of the way the content is being trained and, and, and so forth is going to represent what they're actually learning and how that's going to connect to those business outcomes. And, and I'm really curious because I've been a trainer myself and I've obviously trained, um, and I know what a huge variable that is for, you know, the, the agent or the employee, but also the performance and the ability of that that employee to drive those business outcomes. So I'm interested to see how you break down trainer analysis. Um, trainer analysis, um, first and foremost, uh, when you're talking, what came up for me when you were sharing that is really important to think about the business partnerships that you have. So mm -hmm. when I hear reactive, what I, what comes up for me is you there's a communication issue. Yeah. Somebody's not speaking to somebody. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure those those relationships are strong and that communication is is happening both ways in a timely manner. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and and the other thing I must I, I must say is, is it training or is it a tool? that they need. Mm. So um, perhaps it is just in time knowledge management. Maybe you need a pop-up during that interaction mm. to provide assistance. Um, perhaps it is a blurb that comes out in a weekly newsletter that is then uh, spoken about in the team huddle. Uh, it could be a lot of different things, which is why it's important those com that communication happens and that you have a training team that's led um, by folks that understand the solution is not always pulling people out of queue or off the floor to have a training event. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think this is where data in training versus data in production environments can give you a lot of insight as to, Hey, well, we we've decided to train on this one issue that's showing up in production. Now we're training, we're training, we're training, we're training. It's not improving. So maybe it's not a training issue at all. Right. Um, Correct. And, and, and you've got to be able to understand, or maybe the training that we're putting in place to remedy the problem is not helping for one reason or mm -hmm. another when it should. And that's where, you know, really getting some, some systems in place that can help you with understanding what's happening at a metric level um, is really, really important. I know I, I took us on another rabbit hole there. Um, let's bring it back to trainer analysis, because um, I think this is really a critical variable. Yes, and uh, I think it was a very relevant rabbit hole, so thank you. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yes, so trainer analysis um, be begins with a well-thought-out smiley sheet. Now, unless you're in training, you might think, what is a smiley sheet? So back when I started, and um, I, I'm happy to say it was when we had paper. Right? We were using paper and PowerPoints, um, and it was the, the actual piece of paper or now a digital uh, form that you uh, analyze 
What made you smile? What was great about the training? And when I started, they were simple um, and very, um, they did not have any impact. So things like, were the cookies good? How was the temperature in the room? Did Cherry smile? Well, we know now that some of those things matter. You know, we know temperature matters and comfort and things like that. Well, we need actionable insight on a smiley sheet. Hmm. Um, and um, my my favorite, favorite um, training expert or learning and design practitioner uh, is Will Talheimer. Um, hmm. I am a fan girl. I could probably lead his, uh, be the president of his fan club. Um, so, and knowing him, that would probably, what little bit I know about him, that might embarrass him, but that's the truth. Um, he has taken smiley sheets to a whole new level as he does with everything. Um, he believes in evidence-based practices, which is my jam. I mean, yes, we we need to make sure that what we're doing works and understanding why and how to replicate that. Mm. So he actually has a second edition now out of um, performance focused smiley sheets. And notice this is the most tabbed book. <laughs> Uh, in my library. I believe um, you may it, have spent some time in that book, Sherry. I'm thinking. Yes, it is life changing. Um, and when I when I lead a team, we all have a copy for sure. Oh, wow. Um, and so making sure that we begin by asking the learners about their, their experience with well-designed questions. And that's where Will comes in. He gives you everything you need to design a well um, design great questions and also to understand when to launch a smiley sheet because mm -hmm. timing is everything. If one, if you're trying to capture and you should be, um, are you prepared to do the work we need you to do? And you launch that at the end of a training event when you all feel like singing kumbaya, right? It's oh, this warm, fuzzy, great training environment. I love my trainers. I'm going to answer differently than once I'm in production yep. and whatever production looks like for you, right? Yep. Now I'm willing to tell you, you did not prepare me for this, right? right? Um, so everything from question design to to when to launch that and, and so much more. Uh, we could spend days on, on, on Will. Um, and then also trainer analysis requires observations. Are you in there observing your trainers consistently, um, mm -hmm. making sure that you are providing robust feedback? Um, what is it you're looking for? Um, what is important to you in, in a trainer? Um, and making sure it's key to me when I lead a team that I ask them also to analyze their data. So what are the learners saying about, about your performance? And let's look at their 30, 60, 90 day performance trends. Let's get, we'll both gather that information, come together with our analysis, our areas of opportunity, and don't forget to celebrate. We want to celebrate the success. We often talk about areas of opportunity, very important. But if we don't celebrate success, um, we're not going to be able to retain our training team. And then we will never meet our business outcomes. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. Um, just to take a quick pause, you know, one of our episodes that we've done together was on psychological safety Yes, and, you know, it's an enormous variable and, mm -hmm. you know, thinking specifically about the trainer, um, you know, people who create space in a training environment for psychological safety, for inclusion, uh, for the ability to voice honest feedback for somebody to feel comfortable, like they mm -hmm. can say, Hey, I didn't understand that. Yes. To say, I'm not ready to move on yet. <laughs> um, that, that actually directly impacts business outcomes mm -hmm. because if there's an environment that's created in training where you can't speak up where, you know, and some people are more shy than others, right? Um, sometimes you have a lot of stuff to cover and you, you know, you, you, you've talked about, you know, time allotment as well, but with, with this dynamic of creating um, an environment where someone in training can literally say, I'm not getting it yet without feeling like they're going to be fired or, you know, written up or discounted or seen as, you know, less valuable. That is a really critical thing that really the, 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 the trainer is the one that creates that environment. Right. And, and understanding mm -hmm. culturally that that is desired on the part of the trainer is, is a variable as well. 
Yes. And thank you for bringing that up, Rob, because that when I'm observing a trainer, that's the first thing I look for. Um, one of the things that often um, perplexes me is uh, this whole idea that if somebody doesn't participate in training, they're not learning. Right. So um, absolutely not true. Uh, some of us are deep thinkers. We're in our heads. We're figuring it out in a way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so making sure that um, we're not doing things like uh, popcorn, where we're forcing people to be involved, um, relying on, on, on a, a strategy like that. Um, is antiquated. Right. We need to understand how folks um we need to understand what psychological safety looks like in the classroom and implementing that. And when I taught that at a previous employer, um, it was it I received more feedback about that module than anything else I've ever done, with the exception of coaching with compassion. But that was a different order <laughs> um, because uh, trainers had especially entry level trainers. They really did not have any idea. Um, First of all, what psychological safety was, it's while it's not new, it's relatively new to most of us um, and their role in that and creating that safe space. Um, folks aren't learning if they don't feel safe. Just 100%. hard stop. So thank you for bringing that back, that up. Very yeah. important. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Um, also really important that we are asking the trainer about their experience. Um, we don't, I don't believe that's done often enough. So asking them, do they have what they need? What are their pain points? Um, and making sure that we're creating a great experience for them or we'll lose trainers and that that's not going to assist us in reaching our goals either. 100%. Yeah. So um, design analysis, um, does the design align? The first thing I wanna do um, when I'm looking at content um, before I'm even looking at does this meet the needs of the business is does it align with the organization's diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion and belonging initiatives, period. Um, the images should be reviewed. Do the images represent who's in your classroom? Um, I, um, I worked with an incredible uh, designer, Angie Capone Smith, um, who uh, she made sure every type of person um, with every type of ability was represented in any e-learning module that she created. Wow. Um, she blew my mind. I, she's the first person that I've worked with that really understands it at that level. Wow. Um, she, she made her scenarios diverse as well. Um, making sure that um, language was correct and appropriate. She worked with accents. Um, it, it is her understanding of DEI and belonging um, was exceptional. So I always begin there when I'm analyzing content, because if you disengage your audiences, if they can't see themselves in your content, I mean, they're not psychologically safe. Uh, they may be looking for a new job already, or at the very least, making a shopping list, um, thinking about when is this over? I'm I I need to get out of here. Well, I think this is this is something that CX and other elements of training organizations can borrow from the the clinical research that is available from public education, mm -hmm. right? Where where this idea of uh, if I don't see that I belong, I don't feel that I belong. And and that is a huge variable. And it's something mm -hmm. that there's plenty of research out there to back up. And I think that's really solid. And, and, and another question that's got to be asked too, right, is does the design of this training actually align with the organization's, you know, business goals, such as mm -hmm. we've talked about customer retention a couple of times, right? Um, and that's a big one right now when you're, when you're uh, in an economic down cycle where you're, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing organizations that are downsizing because their revenue is changing and negative trends and, and there's this great fear and there's all this stuff that it feels like a giant shadow over everyone professionally. And yet, are we even asking questions about whether our training is driving the customer retention goals of the, of the company? And, and, you know, are we spending time? and focusing on training that connects the known customer concerns that we know exist mm -hmm. with true solutions that are designed to make customers experience actually better. And that's going to drive, of course, customer retention, which is going to drive all kinds of good business outcomes that make everybody uh, more stable and in a better place. Right. Correct. And if I'm leading your team, that's happening because um, <laughs> I mean, that's why, that's why we're there. 
um, that's not only is it to ensure that our our uh, employees, our agents can perform their job well and that they are empowered to make decisions and they have satisfaction in all of the ways in which we retain employees. Mm-hmm. Um, also necessary that we understand our business. We understand we have those relationships, those partnerships that ensure we understand what's coming, what, what's going to be happening, what changes are being made. Um, and if you're, we're pivoting quickly, those relationships should be so solid that we're top of mind when they're in that last minute meeting to make a decision that has to happen. Um, and and we're that, that communication is happening immediately. Um, if we're not, if those relationships aren't solid and we aren't addressing that, not only are we not going to retain customers, and to your point, we need to make sure that's happening today more than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, we will also lose our folks, right? We will lose new hires. We will lose tenured employees. Whether we lose a new hire or a tenured employee, it's expensive. It's not only expensive um, financially, it also can be really expensive to our reputation um, when people start speaking about. I mean, there are all sorts of apps or um, apps out there now, uh, communication tools where people are, are evaluating employers. No, they really are. And, you know, the, the labor marketplace is so different than it was three years ago, you know, um, yes. especially for agents where there was already a, a higher prevalence of work from home than in other industries. And now, you know, the large portion of, you know, customer experience, customer service agents are work from home. And so they don't have to uproot their lives in order to change jobs. Mm-hmm. Right. And and so- correct there's a lot less motivation to stay in an unsatisfactory or unsafe work environment than there used to be. And that creates a whole different dynamic. Um, You know, we've talked about so much here and um, uh, gosh, I feel like we need a part two already. Um, (laughs) But I just want to pull out a couple things um, before we close our time. One is the difference and balance between proactive versus reactive training. And the way that you're measuring that, you know, and and there's a, there's a balance to be struck there, right? You know, there's always going to be the need to react to things that are dynamically happening in the business and to put training into place, whether that's remedial training, whether that's ongoing training, you know, maybe there's a whole new element to the business that, that agents need to now be trained on um, to be able to do spot training, whatever that is. But there's also making sure that the training investments are aligned with the proactive known business outcome goals that the business has. And we can't lose sight of those things just because we're reacting to some things that are currently on fire. Right. Um, yes. and, and so that's one thing that I think is kind of intertwined throughout our whole conversation today. And and another one is going back to customer retention one more time is thinking about the ability for an agent to know the values to know the boundaries of what they're able to decide and to actually have been trained to see a situation that mm-hmm. has an opportunity to be a negative in the customer experience, customer retention realm, but to empower that agent to make a tangible difference in the life and therefore the experience and therefore the retention of that customer. Yes. And that's how we go from training to business outcome, right? Right. And, and I think that's something that we, we've had built into this whole conversation today. Um, you know, we're unfortunately out of time. I could go for round two, um, but anytime, um, but I, well, well, I guess it would be round four at this point. Actually, yes, it, would. it would be. <laughs> uh, so we'll have to queue up round four before too long, Sherry, but uh, can't thank you enough for being with us again. And uh, just the excellent insight that you have brought for our audience today. Um, We appreciate you and uh, we're glad you could be with us. Thank you, Rob. I feel the same. Have a great day. Yeah. Everybody go out and have a great Tuesday and make a difference. Take care. 